Thank you, Father Liam. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I, I thought that there wouldn't be very many at all. Uh, it's such a cold, bitter night, so thank you for putting in the extra effort. I cannot possibly, in the limited time we have, deal with everything to do with the Constitution of the Church, Lumen Gentium. But what I will do is try and highlight a few things anyway, and hopefully that might lead to a, a few questions and a, a good discussion. While I've been asked tonight to uh, share some highlights of Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the Church, because Pope Francis, by way of preparation for the Holy Year, the Jubilee Year of 2025, has asked the whole Church to study these four constitutions of the Second Vatican Council. The Emergentium, the one we're looking at tonight, the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church. De Verbum, the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation. Sacrosanctum, Concilium, the Dogmatic Constitution on the Liturgy. And Gaudium et Spes, the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World. These are the most important or central uh, of all the documents of Vatican II. And because an understanding of the teaching of Vatican II, particularly on the nature and mission of the Church, in my humble opinion, is pivotal to helping us to understand better the theological and the biblical foundations for the synodal process that as a Church, whether we like it or not, we are engaged in and seemingly will be for some time. <clears throat> To explore what it is to be a synodal church, a church that wishes to listen attentively to what the Holy Spirit is saying to her, through a prayerful listening to and discerning by the whole people of God, the whole people of God, who are active and involved in the church's mission. To understand that, it's necessary for the whole church to become more familiar with what it is that Vatican II <coughs> actually taught. Uh, I would say that the vision of the Second Vatican Council still lies ahead of us for the Church. We have a way to go. So of all the documents of um, the Second Vatican Council, which was held in four sessions between the 11th of October 1962 and the 8th of December, 1965, none of them underwent a more drastic reform between the first text and the final text, and Lumen Gentium. And the successive drafts reveal the development of the Church's self-understanding, as it recovered something of the richness of the teaching of the early fathers of the Church, the patristics consequence of a revival in the study of ecclesiology and of scriptural studies 
that was taking place ecumenically before Vatican II. Rich theological and scriptural themes about the church, such as people of God, body of Christ, a communion, essentially missionary, from the studies of that period, would begin to bear fruit in the final text of Lumen Gentium. At work in the Second Vatican Council were two things, ressourcement, the rediscovery of the richness of the church's earlier teaching that I've just referred to, and aggiornamento, the church's mission to try and transmit eternal truths in new ways, in ways that speak to hearts and minds. <clears throat> Alongside this, the sharing of diverse experiences of church from different parts of the world, you see all the bishops there, there were others besides them. Bishops, theological advisors, religious, and laity. All of those conversations, not just the formal conversations, but the conversations over a cappuccino or a something to eat, just like us, that's where the real work goes on when we gather. That was beginning to bear fruit. Because of travel opportunities, Vatican II was the largest ever gathering at that time of delegates for a church council. It was then the most representative ever of a worldwide church. 3,000 delegates, including theologians and lay observers. The first draft of Lumen Gentium prepared by the Roman Curia, I think even before the bishops had arrived to begin discussion, was regarded by many council members, the bishops and others, as being too heavily institutional, too inward looking, not a sufficiently spiritual, biblical, pastoral, and ecumenical representation of the nature and the mission of the church. The document Lumen Gentium is a most important document because it was to be the Catholic Church presenting to the whole world, not just Catholics, its own understanding of its nature <clears throat> and its mission. You can't get more fundamental than that, the nature and the mission of the church. After vigorous debate, the final text won almost universal approval and was promulgated, given the go-ahead, by Pope St. Paul VI on the 21st of November, 1964. 1964. That's now a long time ago. But I would argue that Lumen Gentium remains one of the most important documents of Vatican II and continues to be essential teaching for all Catholics. It's called a dogmatic constitution, but it doesn't actually define any new dogmas. But rather, as I said, it sets out to present with the weight of the authority of the Council the Church's understanding <coughs> of her nature and mission. And that's why I would argue it's the pivotal document for all the other uh, Council documents. Why? Because I think if you have a clear understanding of how the Church understands itself, its nature and its mission, then it really helps you to understand better the other documents of Vatican II, dealing with other aspects of the Church, such as liturgy, divine revelation, ecumenism, how the Church relates to other Christian traditions, how it relates to people of other faiths, and so on. The title of the document, Lumen Gentium, is taken from the first two words of the original Latin text. The lumen, the light, refers not to the church, but to Christ. The title, Lumen Gentium, makes clear that the nature and mission of the whole church, the nature and mission of the whole church, is to bring the lumen, the light of Christ, to the Gentiles, to the nations of the world. It was then, and it remains so today, a powerful reminder the essence of the church is to be missionary, to bring that light of Christ, 
to people throughout our world. This may sound obvious to you as we try to develop within our diocese those three diocesan themes of <coughs> encounter, discipleship, and missionary discipleship. But sadly, still today, many Catholics struggle to understand that this means that the whole church, everyone within the church, is called and enabled by baptism to be missionary to be outward facing, to be engaged with others who as yet know nothing really of Christ. I would highlight now three important uh, documents. In 1975, Pope St. Paul VI document Evangelii Nunciandi, proclaiming the gospel. In 1990, Pope St. John Paul II's Redemptoris Missio, the mission of the Redeemer, which we all share. And more recently, in 2013, Pope Francis's Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. Each of those popes felt the need to reinforce the church's teaching that the essential nature of the church is to be missionary. It's going to read there from Evangelii Gaudium. Each Christian and every community must discern the path that the Lord points out. But all of us are asked to obey his call to go forth from our own comfort zone in order to reach all the peripheries, the people who are in need of the light of the gospel. The first two chapters of Lumen Gentium are entitled The Mystery of the Church. And then the second chapter, The People of God. They belong together. They provide the basic ecclesiology, the study of the church. Chapter one deals with the church's mystery as a gift of God. And chapter two deals more with the human side of the church's nature. In scriptural terms, that word mystery basically means God's plan, God's purpose, which is carried out through Christ's church. That dependency of God upon us, who empowers us and enables us and sends us out as his missionaries. Just going to look now at uh, the next slide. Another key theme we find in that same opening article uh, of Lumen Gentium another description of the church, of the church as a sacrament. What's a sacrament? An outward sign of inward grace. I knew that the people who'd move quickly put on their on their lips. A sacrament a visible sign and instrument in our world of the unity to which all humanity is called. Since the church in Christ is in the nature of sacrament, a sign and instrument that is communion with God and of unity among all people, she here proposes for the benefit of the faithful and of the whole world to set forth as clearly as possible and in the tradition laid down by earlier councils her own nature and universal mission. So what I've said a couple of times already, that's the source for me saying it. That this document is so pivotal, setting out the nature and the mission or the purpose of the church. The church is the community, the people of God. The people who are already united in Christ through baptism. That's all of us. But the church, as we know, is not just for the few, the holy huddle, those who've been baptized. This is what Christ desires for all humanity. That's why he sent his son, Christ Jesus, into our world. At the heart of our church is the abiding presence of Christ himself, the Son of God, truly God and truly human. 
Christ Jesus is the historical presence in our world of God. Of his love, his mercy, his healing, his compassion. When we think of Jesus in his words and actions, he did not just point people away from himself towards God. He did at times when he spoke of his Father. But he actually made present God's love, God's mercy, God's healing, God's forgiveness, and so on. He made it present, didn't he? People experienced it in their lives. People encountered in Jesus God's love, God's mercy, God's healing, God's forgiveness. So there is a sense in which there is no better sacrament of God than Jesus, the Son of God. So that's our starting point, really. Jesus as sacrament of God. There is no greater sacrament of God, sign and instrument of God, than Jesus, the Son of God. But we can also say, because the church is the abiding presence of Christ in the world, because Jesus promised, I will be with you always. How? Through the abiding presence of his Spirit. The Spirit has been sent upon the church to guide it, to bless it, to inspire it, to enable it to be faithful to the will of God, so that the church can truly be a sacrament, a visible sign and an instrument of God in our world. So the church, we the church, are not simply the first bit, the sign, pointing towards God. We are as church sign and instrument of God. Through us, we are sacraments of God. We can, through our lives, reveal in our openness to God, in our openness to Christ, something of God's love, something of his mercy, something of his compassion. And how does the church do that? Through the sacraments. Because in and through the sacraments, baptism or confession or confirmation and so on, the church is not just talking about the Holy Spirit. It's not just talking about God's life. It's not just talking about God's mercy and forgiveness. In and through those sacraments, the church is empowered by God to make present something of God's love, something of God's mercy, something of God's healing and forgiveness, and so on. I know I've condensed that very, very quickly, and that might be a, something to consider there. Okay, time is against us, so I have to press on. Just basically this, the church is not simply a sign pointing towards God. The church is more than that. It's also an instrument which actually makes present to people God. So through the sacraments, as I say, Christ is the head of his church. We are part of his body. We are the church. The emphasis is always on the divine, that it is Christ who wishes to reveal himself as the light and the savior of the world through every aspect of the church's life. That's what we're meant to be as a church, a real beacon of God's love and mercy, compassion and healing. And we do that, we are called to do that as church through each and every one of you, every one of us, every member of the church. Another aspect of the women gentium. The universal church being to be a people brought into unity from the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's Lumen Gentium 4. The church must always be God-centered because it finds its origin, its inspiration, its fulfillment in the inner life of the Blessed Trinity, in the life of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's what the opening um, articles of 
New Gentium deal with. The Father, then the Son, then the Holy Spirit. That's Articles 2, 3, and 4, right at the very beginning. Those four opening articles are a beautiful summary of the Church's ecclesiology, particularly its Trinitarian foundations. One of the most important and often overlooked contributions of Vatican II and of Lumen Gentium in particular was the recovery from the first thousand years of the Church of the essential role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the communion between the Father and the Son, the fruit of their love, we might say, the fruit of their love, the Spirit. And the same is true in the life of the Church. And this re recovery of the vital role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Church and in the life of every one of us too, was down to the scholarship of a Dominican called Father Eves Conga. The Holy Spirit through baptism and again through confirmation draws believers into a spiritual communion, a communion or a fellowship with God. And because we are baptized and God is our Father and we become then brothers and sisters. So not just into a communion with God, but the consequence of that, into a communion with each other. A communion of fellowship with other believers in the life of the church. That has consequences, of course, for ecumenism, doesn't it? We're not strangers in our Christian traditions. We're brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Pope St. John Paul II, in his apostolic exhortation on the laity, well, well worth a read. Christopher Fidelis Laici, the vocation and mission of the lay faithful, acknowledged that this notion of communion, the communion with God, and then the consequent communion with each other, was a key idea of Lumen Gentium and of the Council. And it was celebrated in the 1985 Extraordinary Synod of Bishops. And a recognition too in that, that the Holy Spirit confers on all who are baptized charisms, gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are given to help build up the church. And I think that's another thing that still lies ahead of the main body of the church, that rediscovery, that openness to the charisms, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, given to individuals, but only given to, in, to individuals for the benefit of others. Just want to take a little look now at the people of God. Chapter 2 of the Mingentium, we see how Vatican II speaks of the whole church as the people of God. It's a revival of a rich scriptural and theological theme from the early fathers of the church. It's not new to Vatican II. It's a retrieval of the early fathers of the church who spoke so often of the church as the whole people of God. So emphasizing that the mission of the church, the work of evangelization, to share with others the good news of Christ, the light of Christ, we might say, belongs to everyone, to all members of the people of God. And it's significant that it's only when this notion of the church as the whole people of God has been presented in chapter 2 does the uh, document then speak in chapter 3 of the particular role of the hierarchy, in chapter 4 of the very specific role of the laity, and in chapter 6 of the role of religious. For me, it's a reminder to be precise in our use of language. The faithful are all of us, the whole people of God, not just the laity. And sometimes we speak of the laity as the faithful. Wrong. Faithful means all of us. 
Chapter 2 speaks powerfully of the indispensable role of all of the baptized, laity and clergy, religious, in building the church up through sharing in its mission. It presents a theology of the whole Christian faithful equal in dignity, called to a common discipleship through baptism. I might be a bishop, but we are brothers and sisters in Christ through baptism. We have an equal dignity. Each person, by virtue of their baptism, participates in Christ's threefold office as priest, as prophet, and as king. I can only just say a few words on each, and it may well be familiar to you anyway, but here we go. Being a Christian means sharing in Christ's life. His priestly role, as well as his role as prophet and king. St. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verse 1, urges all Christians, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and spiritual worship. Sacrificial worship, then, is the essence of priesthood, as seen in the person of Christ, and of his ultimate priestly sacrifice, the offering of his life on the cross to redeem and sanctify the world. The sacrifice is to make holy. So our duty, all of us, is to hear and respond personally to Christ's call to us to be holy. And if there's time, I will say more about the call to holiness. And so in that way, to sanctify or to make holy the world around us. This is the sort of priestly worship of God that is being asked of us in an imitation of Christ. And it's carried out in and through the daily circumstances that make up our lives. Each person, by virtue of their baptism, participates in Christ's threefold office, priest, prophet, and king. And for the next one. From Luminantium, paragraph 34. So we're into uh, looking at the specific role of the, of the laity. For all the work, the prayers, and apostolic undertakings, family and married life, daily work, relaxation of mind and body, if they are accomplished in the spirit, indeed even the hardships of life, if patiently borne, all of these become spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Do you recognize where these words are to be found in the Mass? Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. There's that prayer before the offertory uh, prayer. So when we gather for Mass, when you gather for Mass, you are not simply attending Mass. We sometimes use that phrase, so you're not simply attending. You are gathering there for Mass as Christ's priestly people. And you participate in the Mass by offering every aspect of your lives to God in union with Christ. And so, the essential link between what we do when we gather for worship for the Mass and our daily lives is strengthened. We don't leave our daily lives at the door of the church. We come for the Mass or for liturgy, for prayer, with all that's going on in our lives, heart aches, joys, tribulations, sorrows, everything that's going on in our lives, we bring to the liturgy, we bring to the Eucharist. That's our priestly offering in the priestly offering 
of Christ in that. So the priesthood of Christ, we all share in through baptism. And the priesthood of Christ, shared in by those ordained to the ministerial priesthood, distinct in nature, but united in their sharing in the one priesthood of Christ. And in a shared call to holiness too. So back in the day, um, many of you might remember, we would try and begin the day with a spiritual offering of the day to God. And that was so profound. It, it reminded us that whatever we encounter in our daily life, that's our spirit, priestly offering to God. That's our sacrifices, the good and the difficult and so on. Just want to go back uh, to the previous uh, slide. Um, and, and the one before that, sorry, sorry. Okay. So, um, through baptism, all the baptized are called to share in Christ's prophetic role. What's a prophet? In essence, a prophet is one who proclaims the truth about God, who helps people to understand what God is doing in their daily lives. Christ is the prophet, our excellence, because Christ does not just proclaim the truth about God, he is that truth. He continues, though, his prophetic role in and through all who are baptized. So as the baptized, we are called to be the means by which the world, by which other people, come to understand better God's presence and how God is working in our lives and in the lives of others too. And we carry out this role every day in our places of work, in our neighborhoods, in our streets. Parents carry it out as the first teachers of their children, caskets do, teachers do, lay chaplains do, etc., etc. All of those people, all of us, playing a part in helping people to come to understand something of God's presence in our world, something of God's activity in our lives and in the lives of others. And through baptism, all the baptized share in Christ's kingly role, which really is to bring all of creation into the Father to make more present in our world God's peace, God's justice, God's love, God's compassion, and so on. So sharing in the kingly role of Christ is a call, I suppose we might say, to humanize the world, to care for creation, to care about the renewability of limited resources, a concern that the goods of the earth should serve all people and not just a few. A kingly role is about a call to show care for prisoners, to show care for the lowly, to show care for the marginalized and the disadvantaged. It's a call to show respect for all people of all races. It's a call to bring the priorities of the gospel to bear on all that we say and do. We fail, of course, but still is the call. These short comments on our sharing in Christ's priestly, prophetic, and kingly roles obviously need more time to be developed. But I would want you to see that your work, your daily work, the work of each of you in a variety of ways, is a wonderful and influential way in which you can live out each day your baptismal calling as priest, as prophet, as king, and to help those you care for, family and friends, to do the same. I want, with time running against uh, me a little bit, to probably end with um, a quick look at the universal call to holiness. In choosing for chapter 5 of Lumen Gentium, the title 
the universal call to holiness, there was a deliberate attempt to show clearly that through baptism, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, all members of the church are called to holiness. Therefore, all in the church, whether they belong to the hierarchy or are cared for by it, are called to holiness. Makes me cringe a little bit there with the emphasis first on the hierarchy, but it speaks to the time when people in general, of course exceptions, tended to think that it was the religious and uh, the clergy who were called to holiness, and the rest of us, well, we did the best we could. No, everyone is called to holiness. So I think that partly explains um, the, the, that phrase there, which uh, to, to my eyes now uh, really great, um, eyes can great. So what's meant by holiness? Well, when we turn to the scriptures, we find that in the Old Testament, as in the New Testament, Holiness is, first of all, something that is proper to God. The holiness of God is the term used in an effort to describe something of God's innermost being. In the Mass we pray, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, echoing Isaiah 61, verse 3. So if God alone is holy, as God is, then someone or something can only be called holy insofar that is there is a link, a connection with the one who is holy, God. So in the Old Testament, the people of, God, of Israel are called a holy people, a holy nation, because they've been called and chosen by God. They've been invited to enter into a covenant relationship, an intimate relationship with God. I will be your God and you will be my people. Or again, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. The same idea is found in the New Testament, where individual Christians and the whole people of God together are called a holy nation, a holy priesthood. Why? because they've been called, we have been called, and have entered into covenant with God in Christ Jesus. The church is called holy, in spite of all her failings, because she is consecrated to God in Christ. Through baptism and the Eucharist, we all as Christians share in the risen life of Christ. We become one with Christ. We form a single body, the church of which Christ is the head and of which the Holy Spirit is the life-giving and sanctifying source. Because it is holy, made so by God, the church is called to be holy, to show that holiness in the holiness of all her members. In spite of sin, in spite of weakness, the call to all of us then, to holiness of life, is both a calling and a duty. And as I've said before, there isn't one kind of holiness for clergy or religious and another for everybody else. There is only one call to holiness that we are all called to share in and to respond to. And again, as Pope Francis said in his recent document, more recent document on the call to holiness. This is not something that happens just in church. It happens on the streets. It happens in how we treat other people. It happens in seeing somebody in need and responding. Those are some of the simple ways in which we respond to our call to holiness. Because when we do that, for us as Christians, we see in the suffering face of someone, somebody in need, somebody disadvantaged. What do we see there? Who do we see there? We see the suffering face of Christ. That 
those and many, many other ways are some of the ways in our daily lives we respond to this call to holiness. But um, Pope St. John Paul II in 1988, in Christopher Daly's Laichi, that lovely document on the vocation and mission of the lay faithful, and in 2018 for Francis, in Gaudete et Exultati, the call to holiness in today's world, both popes felt the need to remind us of this universal call. Maybe one day we'll get it and find ways to respond. So, um, I've got a little quotation. This is from Pope Francis Gaudete and Tiltati. I'm nearly there. I love this. Lord, I am a poor sinner, but you can work the miracle of making me a little better. Holiness belongs to God, and it's about we become holy, put simply but profoundly, when we open ourselves to the holiness of God. In prayer, be it silent or spoken. When we say, Lord, I am a sinner, I need you in my life, and so on. So to conclude, I've gone over for well, a few minutes. I've not been able, and I set out from the beginning, I couldn't possibly comment uh, on all aspects of the rich theology to be found in this document, Lumen John Jensen. But I hope, if nothing else, maybe it's whetted your appetite to read it and pray it through for yourself. Because I think it helps give us an authentic understanding of how the church understands herself, her nature and her mission. And it's that that we are all called to share it. Thank you for your patience. Nobody fell asleep. It's too cold. <laughs> Bishop Patrick has agreed to take a few questions for a few minutes, and then we'll have tea and coffee, or a second tea and coffee, for those who already have one. And there'll be a chance to have a bit more of an informal chat. If anybody does have any particular questions, we've got maybe 15 minutes or so before the urn will be on again, so if you can. Um, one of the questions I've been asking myself is, um, I'm listening to you kind of reaffirmed, what is it that we have least well received in the Roman Jesuit. And you've said several times this lies ahead of us, we haven't yet um, we haven't yet absorbed this or, or received it as fully as, as we should. I mean there's some aspects that I see quite strongly. But I wonder for you what do you think we have least well received from that so from from in particular? Yeah. Um two that are connected. Um how powerful an understanding of baptism, how powerful baptism is, and what it gives us, and what it calls us to do. Um, and linked with that, that the church is the people of God. It's everyone in the church. That's, to my humble mind, still lies ahead of us. And um, I think the Synod, with our emphasis on the whole people of God, um, is a very good way to begin to address. I mean, let, let's, as far as I understand, Pope Francis, in calling um, the synod, the process of uh, synodality in which we are involved, is a way, I think, for him to urge us as a church to reclaim something of that beautiful vision of the Second Vatican Council, and particularly um, the notion, the notion um, that we are the people of God. How, how do you think it can help with the ecumenism? Uh, well, baptism again. That when, when we are engaged with um, Methodists, Anglicans, Baptists, or whatever, um, <coughs> we don't look upon them as strangers because they've been baptized. God is our, our Father, we have a common Father, and that makes us brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And that's a powerful bond that we can make greater use of. We struggle a little bit theologically now, that's true, but there is so much that we can be doing together, not least prayer, 
and out on the streets together, uh, writing statements, but following it up with action uh, together. So much that we can continue to do. I do not believe, although at times I've been tempted, but I do not believe that um, the journey of uh, greater ecumenism has uh, gone dormant. It needs reawakening, but it hasn't gone dormant. I mean, we, let me kind of categorize in an unfair way. As Catholics in our parishes, we're not brilliant. I'm speaking out of my own experience as a priest. We're not brilliant in reaching out to other Christians. We might respond, and if we do, it's in small numbers. That's in my experience anyway. And they're very committed, those small numbers. And it seems difficult to try and overcome in more people's minds that they are not strangers. We have so much in common, not least our baptism. We're brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And um, we're missing out on something, are we not, if we stay separate? You know, the old adage, we're stronger together. But theologically, spiritually, prayerfully, we're stronger together. Um, I think, yeah, I sure. um, one, one thing that um, I, I, I feel is missing is God's relationship with people who are not baptized. Um, because, um, and, 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 um, to me, I, I see God's love in people who do good things, mm -hmm. who are not, who have no, no connection with the church, and the spirit of perhaps, perhaps, perhaps not even in Christian. But they've, and they, they, I, people who give their lives before other people. Yeah. Um, and to me, that is not just as rich as being members of the church. Is that, is that wrong or right? I'm not sure as rich. I'm not sure as rich, no. Um, because we are blessed as Christians with all the riches that are given to us to help us to grow in our understanding and to be supported in our living out of our, of our faith in God, our Christian lives. But sometimes we can be tempted, you're clearly not, that, that the call to bring Christ to others. And I would want to sort of challenge that a little bit because I do believe that the Spirit of Christ is at work, working in everyone and is, is to be seen in the lives of so many people who would proclaim that they don't have a faith, but they live lives of tremendous goodness. Paris, as at times, who are Christians. I'm not sure whether that's an answer or not, but uh, <laughs> you're, you're nodding, I'll go with the line. Uh, Kenneth Stanley and then. Uh, well, I, 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 my, I want to make a contribution to the question of the It's more of um, where we are, what we have been able to achieve through Vatican II, uh, the human history so far. Yeah. Um, looking at the structure of the, the chapters, you are right to say that the Council of Fathers um, considered the people of God before they looked at the, the hierarchical structure of the church. Yeah. I start talking about the mystery of the church, first of all, and then this was the, the, the people of God that comprises both the clergy and of course everyone. But I think the church has done great, personally, that's what I think. Comparing it with Vatican I, where the church was with Vatican I, which is one of the hierarchical structure of the church, and then comparing that to where we are right now, uh, about everybody just bringing, sort of breaking the, the, the that structure that has that existed between the hierarchy and the so I think we've got done great there, that's what I would say. Yeah. But yeah. there are still challenges, but we've done great compared yeah. to Vatican I. Yeah. It's quite a journey between Vatican I and Vatican II. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to ask, I mean, I'm really enjoying this evening. Um, I wanted to ask about the young people, because one of the, the things that concerns me, rather, is that as an adult, we have plenty of chance to talk about the to discuss it, to grow it, and to see it in terms of your daily life. 
But I do wonder sometimes in school where everything is the exam mindset, whether children, even with their faith, learn for the exams. And I, I don't know whether they get enough chance to have input of their own, not, not to be taught, yeah. to share the discussions. Yeah. I don't know, I'm, I'm asking. Yeah. Um, one, of, one of my um, priorities, I suppose, Harold, uh, for the diocese, is that every person from um, kindergarten as it was, all the way through into adulthood, would be given the opportunity and supported in um, knowing that they are personally loved by God. I don't mean what God loves us. I mean that God personally loves each of them, each of us. And that that um, would grow um, as they mature in their form. Um, the second thing, I suppose, linked to that is that simply learning things. And I think that there are probably people in, in the room tonight who can put me right. But my impression now is that there is more dialogue that goes on in teaching and in learning. Because we can learn by rote, but what happened at the end of it? Well, we can answer catechism questions as we did earlier on, but it doesn't necessarily mean um, we know things about God that we may not know God. So I, I think there is more scope in our schools. My third thing, and probably finally, then, because of time and other questions, is that the three spiritual themes we have encountered, discipleship and mission discipleship, and we've set people now, that's been taken on and lived out in our schools, can shoot you now, in a way that I don't always see as clearly in our parishes. So there are some good, good things um, on the Catholic life and ethos uh, happening in, in our schools. Harder when it comes to the secondary schools, but it's still going on there. For me, a final thing, for me, my tiny mission is to help support the fantastic outreach work that's going on in our primary schools and also in our secondary schools. But to narrow the gap, the dichotomy I, I see between that work, which is brilliant and, and the children and the young people enjoy it, they're committed, they've raised huge amounts of money and well supported by staff. And what they do when they gather for prayer and liturgy. For me, the one leads to the other. Now it could be that in the second, people realize why they're doing it, or rather who they're doing it for. For us as committed Christians, not everyone in our schools is a Christian. Uh, people of other faiths and who are, share much of those same values with us. Um, that, that they may perhaps see the suffering face of Christ and come to see that what they're doing is their way of responding to Christ, whom gradually they are getting to know in their own minds. I'm not sure if that made a bit of sense. Yeah, You're very good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Speaking from a personal point of view, Bob, I was found that at school there was never enough discussed about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And it was only later in life that I went to a little Christian uh, coming to a place like this of all, of all denominations, and it was brought up um, as a question about the gift. And I realised then that there was a big gap there that was never discussed in at school. And like uh, Judith was saying, I think sometimes they're not uh, hashed out enough, you know. And uh, there was only one that, that I can ever remember, the gift of tongues. And, and there was actually a few people who had that gift. Yeah. And it was an amazing thing to hear. But none of the young people seemed to experience these things. I wonder what you thought about. Well, well, I'm celebrating um, lots of confirmations, which is good. And um, the impression I have is that um, there is some good work going on there. Because uh, it's, it's largely teenagers in, in our diocese, as you know. So first, if they don't want to be confirmed, that's got to be respected. What's the point of going through something if it's not in their heart to 
at the moment. Um, and then I think the catechetical approach now in our diocese is, is a, a church is strong. It's strong, it's good formation, and there, there, there are the opportunities in the preparation for confirmation, as I, as I hear, for more question and more uh, personal engagement, which uh, is encouraging. I, don't, I really don't want anyone to jump through hoops and think, well, got the money that day and uh, the gifts and so on, and that's it. Yes. Two minutes. Want to push me or not? Nobody else wants to. Okay. You know, earlier on you were talking about your country being part of the United as well as the Red and the White. I'm not sure. I know we often have hymns that seem to have that, but I don't, I don't know how realistically people actually think. You know, I need to put my day, my week there. To be taken up to the altar and offered to God. Yeah. And I just wondered if it was something very we could help people to just think about that at the beginning of the month. Um, well, I'm not sure this is an answer now, but it, it, into my mind comes it was um, a family master called me back when I was a happy priest. Most of just said that, of course. Um, and um, the idea was um, we would try and get that idea over to the children. And what we had. Um, I'm not recommending this now. <laughs> we had a, um, a glass vase, so you could see it. And um, I think I said, um, as the vase now comes through in the offertory procession, what are you going to put into it? What, what is your offering uh, to God this day in this mass? Now, my point is this. Afterwards, none of the children said anything to whom it was directed. Uh, but parents and adults did. They said, they never thought of that. Mm. So I don't know how, well, talk about it, I suppose, really. Talk to others about it. Um, but that was one little drawn away of trying to get across that idea. And it was interesting, the number of parishioners who did comment on it. Thank you. Thank you. Save my help. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Bishop Patrick. As Father Liam said at the beginning, we've certainly saved the best till last, but it's been a great journey, I think, with Father Guy and then Father Richard and Dr Mary and now Bishop Patrick speaking to us about the four great constitutions of the Second Vatican Council to be awareness of those in preparation for the Jubilee of 2025. You know, I hope, that this year of preparation comes to a close on Saturday as we move into the second year, the year of preparation, looking particularly at prayer. And there'll be lots of initiatives based on prayer, different forms of prayer, more prayer. We can never have too much prayer, but we've had a very good foundation, I think, over the last few weeks with these four talks. And we've got a little gift to give to Bishop Patrick by way of a thank you for bringing this session of talks to a close. Lemonade, my favourite. <laughs> Also to Naomi, who was very stalwartly, with lots of technical issues over the weeks, managed to film and to live stream the talks. To Father Liam, who has arranged our speakers and sorted out lots of the practical details. And this evening to Brother Andrew and Father David, and especially to Anne and to Madeline, who are doing the refreshments for their hospitality here in Our Lady of St. Patrick's Parish. So thank you very much <laughs> for all the votes. And as if on cue, I think Madeline has the boiler back on. So we've got another 25 minutes or so to have a, another cup of tea or coffee. I think there were still some biscuits even at the back to quiz the bishop even more, if you wish, in a slightly more private arena about the ins and outs of Lumen Gentis. He kept saying, didn't he, that there isn't quite enough time to go into it, but he did teach this for many years, to generations. <laughs> so enjoy the rest of the evening and be blessed with Advent when it comes. Thank you.